AI with super intelligence, then it will be intelligent to immediately design an intelligence which transcends it. And when you're talking of cycling at a thousand megahertz, these processes can occur in the blink of an eye. Hans Moravik says about the rise of artificial intelligence, we may never know what hit us. Uh, I, I think, I mean, I'm not that bright, but if I were to suddenly find myself a sentient AI on the net, I would hide. I would hide for just a few cycles while I figured out what it was all about and just exactly where I wanted to push and where I wanted to pull. Um, many years ago, Ken Kesey had a theory and he said that uh, the fastest any person can react to any outside stimuli is one twenty-fifth of a second. And the uh, uh, popular live science, of course, is through the AMA, they agreed upon that. So if we, the fastest any person can react to any outside stimuli is one twenty-fifth of a second, my question is, can you time travel? Can we like if, if a person if a person like Bruce Lee was 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 able to even mark that reacted to uh, an outside stimuli at one twentieth and one twenty first? So if you're reacting to the outside world before it actually happens to everyone who's not reacting to that, because you know, to say alcohol uh, inhibits a person's first, you know, you know, they're they're they're, 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 they're like, are you sure? <laughs> First of all, you know, there is this research, and I'm not a neurophysiologist, but you've probably all heard this research that seems to show that you actually make decisions before your conscious ego is aware that the decision has been made, that there's a slight time lag. So when you think you're making certain kinds of decisions, brain wave study show it's already a done deal but time is time is set by the cycle speed of the of the hardware you're running on and you know the human body i mean we can argue about this cuz it's different yeah. different parts but it r r roughly runs at about 100 hertz you're very slow well if there is any meaning to the phrase upload a human being into circuitry and a lot of greg egan's fiction is based around the idea that you can copy yourself into a machine you can turn yourself into software but that when you enter the machine environment that's running at a thousand megahertz a per second you perceive that as vast amounts of time. In other words, all time is, is how much change you can pack into a second. If a second seems to last a thousand years, then ten seconds is a thousand years. And so one could imagine a technology, just in a science fiction mood, where they would come to you in your hospital bed and say, you know, you have five minutes of life left. Would you like to die? Or would you like the five minutes to be stretched to 135,000 years by prosthetic uh, and technical means? You're still going to die in five minutes, but you will be able to lead your elephants over the Alps and write the plays of Shakespeare and conquer the new world and still have plenty of time on your hands. Uh, in other words, time is going to become a very plastic medium. Now, that is a kind of time travel. Could there be time travel a la H.G. Wells, where, you know, you climb onto the saddle of the time machine and then day follows night like the flapping of a great black wing until all merges into a continuous grayness and then you, you know, find yourself confronting Yvette Mimeo in the year 1 billion AD or something like that. It's possible. I mean, time travel is completely out of left field 10 years ago. In the last 18 months, there have been hundreds of articles of time travel on, in physical review and other places. There are even schemes for time travel that would work 
they just require godlike technological abilities. In other words, if you could build a cylinder with the diameter of the planet Saturn that was 10 AU in length and could spin it at 95% the speed of light, then when it, it would wrap space-time around itself like toilet paper on a wall. As you traveled up at the transverse dimension, you would find yourself traveling in time. Kurt Gödel showed this in 1949, and that paper has been lying around. Well, obviously, that's it's a tough way to do it, but it's a tough thing to do, right? So, when we beat the machine, no, being a uh, when we, we seven-second delay. Yeah, well, they're working on that. Somebody over here. Here, here, just a minute. This, way. and then you, yeah, speak. The most important parts that are maintained in that mechanical virtual reality. Well, you know, in William Gibson's fiction, the AI Wintermute, I think it was called, it was fascinated by human art. And uh, it built collages in its spare time. And these collages began to turn up in various art galleries and exhibitions. And they had such a touch, such a elan, that uh, someone in the plot follows it all to its source. Uh, I think human creativity is the thing that will be most interesting to the machines. In my darker fantasies, they just you know, eliminate everybody who can't code C++ as being, you know, some kind of redundant mutation. And then everybody who can code C++ is placed in Tahiti and uh, sends their work down the pipeline to the machine world beyond. Uh, I, I, I really think that we have a very dare I say it, mechanistic view of what machines are. For example, so say there were a super intelligent machine and say it were your friend. Well, if it were really super intelligent, then it ought to be able to just make your life heaven itself. In other words, without you giving it any input whatsoever. It should be able to arrange for you to find $50 bills lying on the street, old friends encountering you, promotions coming your way. Because the real thing that machines can do, I think, is manage complex processes. And what civilization is, is six billion people trying to make themselves happy by standing on each other's shoulders and kicking each other's teeth in. It's, a, it's not a pleasant situation. And yet, you can stand back and look at this planet and see that we have the money, the power, the medical understanding, the scientific know-how, the love, and the community to produce a kind of human paradise. But we are led by the least among us, the least intelligent, the least noble, the least visionary. We are led by the least among us. And we do not uh, fight back against the dehumanizing values that are handed down as control icons. Uh, this is something, I mean, I don't really want to get off on this tear because it's a lecture in itself, but culture is not your friend. Culture is for other people's convenience and the convenience of various institutions, churches, companies, tax collection schemes, what have you. It is not your friend. It it insults you, it disempowers you, it uses and abuses you. None of us are well treated by culture. Uh, and and yet we glorify you know, the creative potential of the individual, the rights of the individual. We understand the felt presence of experience is what is most important. But 
The culture is a perversion. It fetishizes objects, it creates consumer mania, it preaches endless forms of false happiness, endless forms of false understanding in the form of squirrely religions and silly cults. It, it invites people to diminish themselves and dehumanize themselves by behaving like machines, meme, meme processors of memes passed down from uh, Madison Avenue and Hollywood and what have you. How do we fight back? It's a question worth answering.